I am um, I'm the acting chair of uh, Teasdale Special Flora, or to give us our full name, um, Dr. M.E. Bradshaw's Teasdale Special Flora Research and Conservation Trust. And the, uh, the name says it all. I mean, really, we are all here, and this project is here because of Margaret. Um, it is Margaret's tenacity and her passion and her commitment um, over the last 50, 60, 70 years in terms of the Teasdale Special Flora that actually is, is the reason we're all together. The Trust um, was set up by Margaret in 2017 and it's to act um, for the research and conservation of the Arctic Alpine Flora in Teasdale. We have done a no number of small projects over the years, mainly focused on research, which if you visit the exhibition down the corridor, there's some information banners about that, and this is what um, Martin and Margaret will talk about tonight. This actual talk is part of a series of talks that we're running under the Plants on the Edge project. So this is a bid that we put into the government's Green Recovery Challenge Fund, and we received it in the autumn of last year. And we work across three different areas. Um, we have an engagement officer called Naomi, who is the person who's actually organised this talk tonight, does all the publicity. Um, we have a research theme, which John does the field work for. We've produced a couple of um, technical reports, one looking at uh, other research and monitoring we might want to do, and one looking at species recovery as to how we actually bring the tiny giants back and the steps we can take there. We have an engagement programme, and as part of that, um, the Upper Teesdale Botany Group has delivered a fantastic range of talks and guided walks over the autumn and the winter, of sort of, oh, sorry, the, yes, the autumn, winter and spring and summer, because uh, we're now coming into autumn again. And um, we've done a big schools engagement project, and the schools engagement, again, was working with local schools, so uh, Teesdale Comprehensive, Barnard Castle School, um, Middleton and Teasdale Primary School and also the Scouts in Middleton and they've worked with artists and the, uh, the artworks they've produced are in the, um, the gallery at the bottom there. So I think I have um, rambled on enough and I will uh, let the experts speak. So if I can give you um, Dr Margaret Bradshaw and um, you are a doctor as well aren't you John? No. You're not. And John O'Reilly. <laughs> who will talk to you about the Arctic Alpine flora in Teesdale. Thank you very much. <coughs> well, our subject is climate change and will the tiny giant giants, I love this expression that the children have come up with, will the tiny giants survive? The TC flora and the special flora, the rare plants and notable uh, species, they have experienced climate changes before. And I want to start tonight by just referring to the coldest of those periods and that will be to the last ice period. The ice age consisted of a number of ice periods with warm periods in between, and the last of the ice ages, the last but one main ice cover was the one that extended over the greater part of uh, the British Isles, and the last one extended to rather south of us, uh, about by the Humber across to the Severn, everywhere north of that. Below it would have been tundra, arctic type vegetation, uh, and climate not very warm. Um, I think um, this is the best slide I could provide, which is meant to show you the T-Sale ice cap. 
Teasdale had its own glossier. It was unique even in those days. It didn't get ice in from Scandinavia and the Lake District or other parts. It had its own glossier. I wonder if this is something to do with the fact that it's sort of equidistant from the current North Sea and the Atlantic. Uh, I'm not sure. So it had its own ice sheet, but when that started to melt, oh, 12,000 years or so ago, uh, it left a lot of bare ground. Um, I don't know. Uh, oh, things have happened. Uh, sorry. Let me go back where I was. I'm not sure if I can manage this. It's not back. Oh, no. <laughs> Sometimes you touch these things and things happen too much. There's a glacier over there, and that arrow is at the snout of the glacier with the area underneath where you get a great cavern underneath the glacier. And that part, which is melting as the ice slowly moves, deposits all the bits of rock and dust and fine particles and big boulders that the glacier has accumulated as it's ground over the landscape. Um, those get deposited and you get them left on each side or you might be able to see on the right-hand side there are a couple of uh, moraines. They are very steep at that stage. It's like climbing a mountain. But they get weathered and rounded so that they appear like what we've got in Teesdale today. Um, this would... Oh, that's the... <coughs> outflow from the mouth of the glacier and you see in the valley bottom there that there is a lot of gravel with streams running through it. All lots, the important thing is there's a lot of bare ground ready to be occupied by plants. And those plants in Britain would have spread from the south and from the east. Um, here on the left uh, shows the position of the ice sheet, but on the right you've got the British Isles and the continent um, towards the side. Uh, much of the North Sea was land, so called. Some of you know of Dogger Bank, and Dogger Land was the area between. Hol present day Holland and Denmark and Britain and then across the English Channel was dry and uh, France was linked on with um, Wales, England, Wales and Ireland, a land bridge joining them all. <coughs> Excuse me. And so you've got bare ground being exposed, which will begin to be colonised by um, plants. Um, the plants weren't sorted out quite in the same way as we have them now sorted. You find plants from the east and the south all coming in, spreading into this bare ground. So you get what we will call modern day, um, modern day Arctic and Alpine species and southern species, all, you know, free for all, spreading in as much as they could. I've shown a couple of examples of what it might have looked like. We don't really know, we weren't there. But here's a wet habitat on the 
or the centre there uh, towards the right, and then a dry habitat towards the left. Uh, the wet one, there's a bit of yellow you see, might have had yellow mountain saturage in it. The one in the dry one, we've got sea plantain, uh, we've got tea cell violets growing in there, and uh, blue bow grass. Um, plants that are relic species that we've got in Teesdale now. Some of the other species that spread, we call them pioneers because they're coming, the first ones into these habitats. So you've got blue bow grass top left, below it is hoary rock rose, uh, spring gentian, I'm sure most of you know, and above that, horseshoe vetch, um, nowadays common in the south. And um, a whole large number of species. I'm just going to skip this one and then go back to it to see. Oh. This slide is one that was photographed in North Norway, uh, sent to me by Jeremy Roberts, and I don't know how much detail you could see. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> um, you've got mountain avens there. Um, some of you may be able to pick out leaves over to the right there of um, Alpine Bistort. Uh, the little cushion by the mountain avens was, oh dear, Salidia calling. Sorry, folks, can't just remember it this day. We took come. Uh, someone might supply it. It's a little champion, pink flower. You get it in the mountains of Scotland. And I know when I looked at it carefully that there's some alpine meadow rue. Uh, there are several dwarf willows, um, probably red salix reticulata, also from Scotland, a rather round-leafed round willow, prostrate, uh, one which is salix lapot, uh, no, no, wait a Oh, never mind. <laughs> we don't get it in this country, but it, it's a wonderful slide, that. Uh, I'll just go back now. How do we know about these records and what plants were there? Well, uh, a doctor Turner from Durham University and their students did a lot of investigations in what is now the reservoir basin and on the bogs by Widgebank Fell and part near Cronkley Fell. And you use something called a peat borer. There's a picture of it there. It's about that length. It's quite heavy. And that can be pushed down into a peat or through grass to peat underneath, and a sample brought back. And that sample slices it will be taken out of it and suitably treated, you'll be able to see the pollen grains in it. Pollen grains have got tough outer skins, don't dissolve very easily. And the diagram on the left hand side. Uh, shows a whole number of pollen grains. These are of tree pollens. At the top there is alder, below that birch, below that, I'm just reading the names, Corallus is hazel, hornbeam, oaks, oaks with three ridges down, three grooves down each side. Um, Elm and then limes, two kinds of limes. Uh, 
It's more leaf time till it called later would be the one. And then at the bottom, notice pine, which has pine pollen, has two little bladders on each side. So these help it to be blown around in the wind. They also keep it alive, a low, a lay, sorry, afloat on the surface of water for some time until it, it sinks. Um, <coughs> and pollen analysis, the people who are experts in it, can produce, um, can produce diagrams, they look somewhat like this, and you can see we've got birch, pine, elm, oak, alder, willow, juniper, hazel, grasses, sedges, heather, dwarf, birch, and then a number of the rare species of which uh, a few pollen grains were found in the samples from the area that I mentioned in Kingsdale. It's amazing they found any, I think. Um, so, in the earlier stage, this was just as things were warming up after the ice started to melt. Uh, there would have been um, dwarf birch, uh, lots of willows, certain number of grasses and sedges, uh, ordinary birch uh, uh, as part of the flora, plus some of those uh, pictures I've just been showing you uh, in the previous slides. Uh, after that slow warm-up from the end of the Ice Age, you did get a little blip and it went cold again, and then it started to warm, and then in the period known as the Boreal, it started warming um, relatively quickly. Not quickly like we would think, say, from the beginning of last century to this one. Relatively quickly might have meant in um, a thousand years. But it warmed up uh, fairly quickly then, and we've seen that, you began to get scrub developing. Uh, this is, I think, a Norwegian slide, but it's got some birch wood with uh, a lot of herbs, grassy sedges and flowering plants in amongst it. Uh, dwarf birch can grow to bushes this height, and also, from my own experience in North Sweden, um, you've got quite a variety of willows, usually ones which are very hairy and known as woolly willows. <laughs> We've got two rare woolly willows in this country. Amongst the herbs, you might expect to find some of those that we find in uh, meadows nowadays. Um, sorry, globe flower, um, ladies' mantle species, possibly Jacob's ladder was in there. You get it growing with herb rich species in Derbyshire. So, I think that's a place it might be, though I've not seen it in the Arctic. And low flowers, wood cranes bill, uh, and many more plants you'll be familiar with. Um, we then move on from the uh, from from that part which would have been willow scrub up to willow trees, sorry, birch tree height, uh, that is then 
followed in the Boreal period with the rise of pine. The second one there, can you see where, it says Atlantic there, where the pine column is getting quite fat. Um, I remember Dr. Turner saying she was surprised at this pine and that it continued to exist after she would have expected from other parts of the country it had been crowded out by deciduous trees. And I said, well, that's okay because we've got... Remember once the dinosaurs, you've got the great big ones and they died out. But the little ones survived and possibly became birds. Yeah? Okay, well, up in Tiso, we've got one of the little plants, and that is the sedge, early spring sedge, which is found growing underneath pine woods in Scandin South Scandinavia and right across into Europe. Well, that exists in Teesdale, but the trees have gone. Um, so we then come on to a warmer period and what is known as the forest maximum. The maximum temperature was about two degrees warmer than what the last century was, or beginning of this, but not the last 10 years. It may have been about the temperature we've been in the summer, mean temperature, what we've been experiencing in a few of the last years, including this year. And so in the woodlands, well, you've got oak, Elm was quite, witch elm was the one in the north of England. Ash, ash on the limestone would have been very common. Alder in the wetter places by the river. But all that time when there was the forest maximum, there would have been open areas. There would have been glades, grassy ones, maintained. Uh, by grazing animals, wild, um, a number of deer, oryx, the wild cattle of the time, would all have helped to keep it clear. But the other thing is that some of the very shallow soils, like the sugar limestone and the wet gravelly sites, wouldn't. <coughs> Sorry, <coughs> wouldn't have had trees on them. They would have, um, uh, they would have remained open. And when I say open, open to the sky, as well as the ground having bare patches, the river at sides, the cliffs, as well, lake margins. And so there would always have been those open areas, but we now go from the uh, warmest part, when you have the major distribution of uh, deciduous woodland in the country, and even in Teesdale you would have had woodland going right up to the top of the tail, a rather sparse uh, number of trees as you got to the highest altitudes. Uh, just following this time, uh, one got the breakthrough of the North, sorry, of the North Sea linking up with the uh, linking up with the English Channel. And that would have had quite a major effect on the climate because you get currents going all the way round. You've got the um, Gulf Stream coming in at the north end of the Scotland and down into the uh, North Sea, 
to have been warming the sea and linking up with the English Channel so that you got a water flow all the way through. The break between Ireland and England uh, would have happened also, and that break between uh, France, Brittany, uh, South England, Wales and Ireland would also have broken up. So our flora would just have been that which had arrived before the sea barrier developed. Um, a result of all of this and a general cooling and wetter period for the whole of Northern Europe meant that you began to get uh, bogs developing. Blanket bog in the higher levels uh, in this country, valley bogs. Oh. I seem to have lost a slide. Where's it got to? Mm. Oh, I'm sorry, folk. I don't know where my bog has got to. <laughs> Oh dear, I've lost my bog. And then, that's funny, he's probably turned up in, out in the, in the wrong places. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yes, it's a shame you can't see. I've got a little side picture here, which is a lovely wet bog. I'm sure it'll turn up somewhere, it should do. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Uh, right. Here's my wet bog at the, on the right-hand side. And uh, as you can see, it's a very wet one. Uh, this is a sort of state. It, it was actually photographed on the, one, on the bog between uh, the limestone of... Winnebank Fell and Cauldron Snout, and it has a lot of sphagnum in it, active growing sphagnum. And it was the development of vegetation which, uh, with the sphagnum in it, that enabled the bogs to develop because sphagnum could hold water. Uh, as you probably know, uh, 2,000 years before present, no, before that, 3,000 years before present, when the blanket bog started to develop. So we've gone from cold, warmed up to the uh, maximum temperature, then we started to cool, then we got cooler and wetter. And some said that we're in this same period still. <laughs> uh, maybe in comparison we are. Um, well, that now brings me to a time I'm coming up to... Uh, Sorry, I've got to go back a bit because I wanted to pop man into the picture. Um, that's a little tiny piece of work church which is like flint about an inch long. And with a lot of those all jammed into a piece of hazelwood, you could have formed a spear that you could catch fish with. And I guess in the wheel area of the teas, there would have been plenty of fish that uh, a summer visitor onto the fell could have caught. Uh, quick move, if you've got 
if you've got Natural History of Upper Teesdale, the recent edition of that, Volume 5, there are some excellent photographs in the article by Tom Gledhill on the history of man in the area uh, of areas using area photography or radar of some kind to show you what's on the ground and there is evidence not so much of Stone Age man as uh, because theirs were temporary summer camps to begin with and then you've got Neolithic, Iron Age, uh, Bronze Age and on to modern times. As I move quickly on to uh, modern times and what is now being called the age of man, uh, this is the time when man is really being more dominant than the climate. But who knows, climate might still get the upper hand. And there would be grazing, there would have been grazing from Neolithic times onwards with cattle. I don't think the earlier ones were belted, but they uh, were a primitive cattle type and uh, maybe long, developed from longhorns or longhorns developed from them. Uh, there would have been sheep as well as wild deer grazing. Um, the top photograph is rather dark, but showing early mining, early mining, uh, mining for lead in Teesdale, uh, that's the Teesdale vein, and they went down and formed bell pits, opened out, worked along the veins, got it out, and there's a whole series of evidence of them. Uh, if any of you know Teesdale, it's about opposite that rather hideous little brick uh, former, former, I was going to say Bothy, but what I meant was a place where I think they got a bit of shelter for the shooting groups at lunchtime. But you probably know the place I mean, just as you get up, as you're going up the road to go green. Um, that's early lead mining, uh, very much more lead mining in the uh, 19th century, uh, cow green mine and the um, the buildings at the top of, with the crushing mill there uh, or sorting mill by the by the teas that of course has been um, demolished and most of the area by the teas on the uh, right hand side there is of course under the Calgary Reservoir now. And um, we also, I mean, visitors, tourists to the country started in the 19th century, particularly in the Napoleon War time when people didn't go abroad to do the Grand Tour, so they discovered Britain. And some of you may have got a copy, I must try and get one of the um, visitor guide that was published, I think about 1826, and they just reprinted, printed a facility, they reprinted a copy of it, I think it'll be for sale in the Tuesday Mercury shop. Um, I forgot the author's name, but it, it's a guide and it's also got a list of plants in it. An early list of plants. Yes. So, tourism is not a new thing, but 
certainly since the beginning of this century, and particularly uh, since a few years ago, there's increasing more and more people coming into the jail. So we went from a very cold period, it began to warm with a little blip, went cold again, it warmed again, and then it warmed relatively quickly, and we got a great migration of plants coming across the whole of the country and up the hills, uh, uh, leading to the forest maximum period. And then I just mentioned the, oh, we then got the change, we got uh, the British Isles becoming islands and a wetter, cooler climate developing with blanket fog developing. And I put in a bit of the history of man's activities, very, very brief. Uh, you find a lot more in actual history of a tea if you've got a copy or it's online. I've got one or two hard copies. And at this point, I want to hand over to John, who's going to tell you John has been doing recording of the distribution of rare plants in Upper Teesdale. He's completed his survey of Widbank Fell and has been working on Cronkin Fell last year and this year. And so he's going to bring us up to date with a bit of the picture of the distribution now. And then I'll come in again at the end to um, round things off. What is it to do with this about closing that down and putting yours in? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I should be able to um, get yours up again when I'm finished mine. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, everybody. Oops, I'm supposed to use this. Can you hear me okay? No? Uh, is that better? Yes. Okay. If I, if I get quieter again, remind me, and I'll try and put it closer to my mouth again. Um, let me just get the talk up. Uh, so in 2017, Margaret um, asked me to start helping with recording the, the plants in Upper Teesdale uh, in quite a bit of detail. Uh, and um, it's been a great, great opportunity, a great job to do. Um, just let me see how this is going. Right. And, and this is the kind of area that we're trying to uh, cover. It's, it's obviously a very big area. It's about uh, 25 or 30 miles east to west uh, 20 and 15 or 20 miles north to south. But the rare plants are kind of concentrated in a few uh, small areas within there. So most of what I'm going to say over the next few minutes is about what we found on Willybank Fell and Cronkley Fell, because for the first few years we've concentrated on those particular areas. And so um, the main survey method we use, I don't know if you can see in this photograph, there are some bamboo canes uh, with little stickers on them. You might be able to make them out. So what we do is we mark out on the ground uh, squares of 10 meters by 10 meters. And we search systematically through the squares, uh, looking for all of the rare plants we can find. Uh, now, this picture gives a misleading impression of what the survey is like, because normally it's just me by myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but occasionally we get groups of people and show them what it's about, and they help out a little bit. Um, yeah, so we record, uh, we've got like um, sites that Natural England have kind of defined before the project and we search systematically through those sites, uh, each 10 meter square, and we look for all of the rare plants and if we find one we, we say yes, we found it there, if we don't find anything, uh, you know, we still record the squares that we searched in. Uh, and we don't try and say how abundant the plants were in the squares. We just say that they were present. 
And so far, um, this information now is up to date only to the end of last year because there hasn't been time yet to incorporate this year's data. Uh, so we've, we've created over 20,000 new botanical records and surveyed over 10,000 of these 10 meter squares. And on, on Widdybank Fell, which is where I concentrated for most of the first four and a half years, uh, these, are, these orange areas are the squares that have been surveyed in detail. Um, so on the, on the um, left hand side, the track that you're probably familiar with goes down from the car park, which is in the north of that photograph. And you can see the dam down at the, at the bottom of the photograph. Uh, a lot of the rare plant areas then are further east. And on Cronkley Fell, uh, we just started that last year. So we only did about 660 squares last year. Uh, and this year, um, that total has gone up to about 2,000 now. And by the end of the season, it should be closer to 3,000 squares. Uh, we've got a list of about 120 or so plants that are of interest that occur in Teesdale. And so far in the project, we've recorded 78 of those species. That was up to, up to last year. And on this pie chart, uh, there are different colors for individual species because some of them are much more common than others. Uh, so the top 10 species in terms of their abundance make up about three quarters of all of the records and then everything else is much rarer than that. Uh, and the most abundant species overall is false sedge, which you'll see a picture of later. So now that we've surveyed some of these areas in detail uh, comprehensively, uh, we're able to make these maps showing uh, the kind of hot spots for the rare plants, which, which are the areas where you get most of them concentrated in a small area. Uh, and the orange areas are the areas we've searched and then the white to blue areas uh, show you the density of the number of rare species. So the darker colors are where you have maybe seven or eight or nine of the rare species in a square and the white areas you might only have one or two. Uh, we'll be able to fill in a lot more on Cronkley Fell after the end of this year. Uh, now, back in the 1960s and 70s, uh, when the plans were around to construct the reservoir, uh, Margaret organized uh, groups of volunteers to survey on Widdybank Fell on some of the areas that would be flooded and also some of the areas that wouldn't be flooded adjacent to them. And they covered that, that ground in quite a bit of detail. And so we were able to compare the results of that survey to what we found more recently. And I'll just show you a few of the highlights of that survey, or a few examples. So this is one species, Mountain Everlasting. Um, and on these maps, the next few maps that follow, uh, the pale yellow areas are the areas that were searched in both surveys. And then the orange squares are where they found the plant in the previous survey in the 1960s and 70s. And the blue dots are where we found it in the more recent survey. And so you can see on this map that there are a lot of orange areas where it was found in the 1960s and 70s, uh, but with no blue dots on top. So we didn't find the species again more recently. And there are very few areas with blue dots without an orange uh, square behind it. So overall, the species Mountain Everlasting has declined uh, by 84% since the 1960s and 70s. Uh, spring gentian has declined by about 54% in, in extent. And Teesdale violet hasn't declined quite as much as the other ones, just 19% in extent. Um, but on average, uh, the overall decline in extent of the species we compared was about 54%. So of 19 species that were surveyed in a similar way both times, 18 of them had declined, and on the average decline was 
And that doesn't include uh, any loss due to flooding by the reservoir. It's just, the, just in the areas that were surveyed both times. So that's a bit uh, sad, really, that that has happened. Um, and, which is w and this is one of the reasons why it's useful to do this project now to map the current distribution of the species in detail so that conservation effort can be targeted uh, you know, with some knowledge of where exactly everything is. Uh, so for the last bit of my section of the talk, I'm just going to show you a few examples of the distributions of some of the species on Wittybank and Cronkley Fells from, from the last few years. And there are kind of three main habitats that these species occur in on, on those two fells. Um, mostly associated with the sugar limestone, which you've probably heard of. Um, and the thing about the sugar limestone is that it keeps eroding, and so that helps to maintain the conditions uh, quite open. And most of the rare plants uh, need open conditions. They don't survive very well if they're shaded out by, by taller plants. So the three main habitats are kind of wet habitats of uh, flushed areas with water flowing over the ground on the sugar limestone, and that's usually quite an open habitat. And then you've got dry uh, habitat on the sugar limestone, and then you've got kind of more closed grassland with a slightly deeper soil above the limestone. So here's a few species that uh, occur in the flushed habitats. Uh, oh, actually, and I'll go back. Um, you see the... Um, big hummock on the bottom right-hand side of the picture. Uh, that's a particular moss species that forms those hummocks in, in this habitat. And this particular habitat is unique to Upper Teesdale in Britain. You don't get this uh, anywhere else, really. And some of the rare species, well, a lot of them like these really open conditions, uh, but one of them, Teesdale sandwort, uh, gr often grows on the side of these moss hummocks. So false sedge, uh, which I mentioned earlier, um, in England, it's really only found in Teesdale. Uh, and and in, in Britain as a whole, then the only other area is kind of the Ben Laws area of Scotland. So it's quite a rare plant nationally. Um, but in, on Wittybank Fell in particular, it's the most abundant of the Teesdale rarities. So close to 3,000 uh, records of it from the last few years. So in all of the kind of wet habitats on the sugar limestone, it's super abundant. Uh, there must be many, many millions of plants on Willybank Fell. Uh, but interestingly, in the same habitat on Cronkley Fell, it's usually absent entirely. It's, it's very localized on Cronkley Fell. So that's been very interesting for me to find, uh, you know, comparing and contrasting the two fells that both have similar habitats. Uh, bird's eye primrose often grows with it. It's another species of these wet habitats. Um, and nationally, that has a kind of curious distribution. It's really a plant of northern England and absent further north and south. Uh, but overall in Europe, it's more of a uh, northern uh, or alpine species. And again, it's, it occurs in a lot of the same areas on Wittybank Fell, and it's kind of uh, also quite widespread in Cronkley Fell in, in this habitat. Uh, another species that's very common in the flushed areas, but is quite rare nationally, is Alpine Rush. Uh, this is a little bit more common than False Sedge nationally, but not very much. And it often grows with false sedge on Wittybank Fell, but not quite as abundant as it on, on Wittybank Fell. Uh, but it's much more abundant than, than false sedge on Cronkley Fell. So in all of the calcareous flushes on Cronkley Fell, you tend to get alpine rush, uh, whereas false sedge is often missing from, from those areas. <coughs> so those three are examples of, of some of the more common species in the wet habitats. And then one of the really rare ones is Teesdale sandwort. And you can see on the distribution map here, there's just uh, one, one or two dots because this species occurs in Teesdale and nowhere else in Britain. And on this slide, you can see the entire national distribution of, of the species. 
it, it only is found on Willybank Fell. Uh, the biggest population is in the fold psych flushes, kind of in the middle of, of Willybank Fell. And then there's a few smaller populations along Red Psyche. And I think this is just the last one from the wet habitats. Uh, you might be familiar with this plant from uh, the seaside or from gardens. Um, thrift is normally a coastal species growing in salt marshes or coastal cliffs. Um, but there are some naturally occurring populations in the mountains, both in Teesdale and, and in Scotland. Uh, most of the other dots inland on this map are where it's been introduced. Um, but it does occur as a natural component of the, of the vegetation here. And on Woody Bank Fell, the main area where it grows is in Sand Syke, up in the north there, with smaller population towards the reservoir uh, along Slapestone Syke. And this is one of the species that isn't found at all on Cronkley Fell. So, so some species are unique to Woody Bank and some, some to Cronkley Fell in Teesdale. Um, <clears throat> turning to the grassland now, this slide shows you a typical kind of view of some of the eroding areas on the sugar limestone, uh, which maintain those open habitats that the plants like. And some of the species are really, you know, they really only occur in the most open habitats. They don't like it being closed at all, more or less. And one of the more common um, ones of those is spring sandwort which also, its main national distribution is, is focused in northern England. Um, and, th and this map here, excuse me, <coughs> this map here shows you um, where we found it on, on Wittybank and Cronkley Fells. Um, and you can see it's kind of more or less equally common in the habitats on, on both fells there. And then the next few are kind of much more rare species that you get in this habitat. So one of the really special ones is Teesdale violet, which likes these very bare open conditions. And nationally, you can see it's got very few dots, just in a few places in the north of England. And on Wittybank Fell, uh, there's quite a lot of it along the exposed uh, sugar limestone along, that goes along Red Syke. And again, it doesn't occur on Cronkley Fell, it's only on Wittybank Fell in Teesdale. Uh, this one is dwarf milkwort. Um, so this is an example of a species with a mainly southern distribution. And the unique thing about Teesdale, the flora in Teesdale, is that we've got a lot of kind of Arctic alpine and northern species, but mixed with them are southern species at the northern end of their distribution. And so you don't get that particular mixture of species anywhere else, really. So these southern species are quite special here as well. And you can see there's only a few dots for this. This is much uh, rarer than some of the other species I've spoken about, um, uh, dwarf milkwort. And you get populations on both fells, on, on, on Wittybank and Cronkley Fell. And in fact, these dots here show you the entire extent of the population in Teesdale. We, we've finished the survey for the species. Uh, another example of a southern species that we get here at the northern edge of its range is rare spring sedge. And um, it occurs on both fells, but it's much more common on Cronkley Fell. Now, this map doesn't show you that very obviously because we haven't incorporated this year's data yet. But uh, I found it in many new places on, on Cronkley Fell that haven't been filled in uh, yet on, on the map. And the last of this group that I'm going to show is hoary whitlow grass. And remember, all of these species like the really open uh, dry grassland conditions. Uh, another species that's quite common nationally and it has declined a lot as well as been uncommon in the last kind of 50 or 60 years. And you can see it's very sparse now in, in Teesdale, but this is one of the species that we found had declined a lot since Margaret did her surveys in the 1960s and 70s. So on Wittybank Fell, we only found it in a few places up in the north uh, west of the, of the fell. 
uh, where uh, it was a bit more widespread before and it was in a lot more kind of places on Willybank Fell. It's still reasonably frequent on Cronkley Fell. Uh, so again, uh, not all the information has been filled in on this map yet, but uh, I found it in quite a few places uh, this year on Cronkley Fell. Uh, and a few other species I'll just mention briefly because um, the data haven't been incorporated to show you the maps yet. But these four species occur only on Cronkley Fell and not on Wittybank Fell. And all four are associated with the kind of more open areas on the dry sugar limestone. So you've got mountain avens, hoary rock rose, and the particular subspecies of hoary rock rose that we get is known from Cronkley Fell and nowhere else in the world. So that's quite special. Um, and then horseshoe vetch is another southern species at the northern edge of its range, as is um, small scabious. <coughs> and so all of these, you know, the northern species and the southern species on Cronkley Fell, they grow right beside each other, mi mixed together. Uh, and finally, I think I've just got two more slides to show you. But in the slightly more closed grassland, you get another group of species. Um, that I haven't mentioned yet. And this includes spring gentian. Um, so you can see on the British distribution map, it it's, occurs in Teesdale. There's a red dot further south, but that's an introduced population. Um, and you notice in Ireland, in, in the center of the west of Ireland, there's quite a lot of it. And um, quite a few of the Teesdale species also occur in that part of Ireland, interestingly. And this is one of the more common of the Teesdale rarities in Teesdale. So you can see there's quite a scattering of, of red dots there. And it occurs quite widely in other parts of Teesdale, apart from these two fells as well, of course, you know, in, in other patches of limestone grassland. Um, one more example is Alpine Bistort, which is quite uncommon naturally, although in the northern half of Scotland it's quite uh, widely distributed. But in England, uh, it is quite rare. And this is another species that has a similar distribution in Teesdale to, to spring gentian, uh, occurring on both fells here. And so that's all I have to say. And I'll hand you back to Margaret. Right hook. I will resume then with uh, part three. Will these tiny giants, the rare plants, survive? I don't know. Will they survive? Uh, to recap, if I need to, uh, where they very cold and warm, we don't believe it warm, and then it gradually warmed up so that we went through uh, climate changes at that time. We reached a climate maximum uh, and the forest maximum period as well. Uh, we then got the change when the British Isles became an island and <coughs> Excuse me, and a change of climate in Northern Europe, which led to um, the development of cool, wet climate and the growth of peat bogs. In the valleys, you got valley bogs on the hills of the medium to high level. Uh, you got blanket bog, which some of you will be familiar with. Uh, just to show you what has happened to uh, a few of the Tuesday rarities in the very warm year of 19, warm summer of 19, in, uh, 2018. Uh, first of all, though, 
we had a cold, dry, late winter and running into spring. And over the last few years, uh, strange weather at that time of the year when February could have been very warm and sunny and lovely. And then March, you were back into winter again. And that seemed to continue right through to about June or longer. And then we got it much too hot. So overall, very dry periods uh, right through from the winter to the spring and the early summer. And on the uh, left-hand side, you've got the hoary wicklow grass, one of the ones John spoke about, looking very dry and shrunken. Uh, Tuesday violet lowered down with its leaves looking very purple, indicating they were under stress. Uh, spring sun, uh, no, sorry, um, dwarf milkwort in the middle is a normal looking plant, but in um, July, yes, of oh, July of 2019, it was looking very yellow and sick and limp. And in fact, I did my recording in July, as usual, of one of the plots. I think I got about 50 odd plants in there. And because so many had looked wilted, I wondered if they'd survive. I recorded again in September, and I had lost over 50% of those plants had died. Um, uh, making use of information from the uh, 1967 hot, dry spring, summer, and hot summer, which some of you might remember, and records there of Dwarf Milkwort on uh, Cronkley Fell in orangey colour, and I think that's right, and, Mickle, and uh, Widbank Fell in blue. Uh, you see that there was a decrease, decrease 75, you really only pick it up the following year, uh, 76 showed how much we'd lost in 75 and then continuing in fact into 77. And then after that, uh, climatic competitions weren't, uh, were more or less back to what was then normal, but you see the Cronkley plants did recover more quickly than the Widgebank Fells plants. The situation on uh, Widgebank Fell at the moment and Cronkley Fell is you can see and notice the figures on the left hand side of the graph at this side. You see, there are not very many plants in the samples. And uh, Right. No, those are two, sorry, uh, that last one has got two plots on Widgebank Fell and one of them, uh, if we take it from 2018 onwards, these are two separate plots on Widgebank Fell, but the numbers of plants are going down and they are continuing to go down. Uh, I'm pleased to say 2022 uh, for the orange one there will be about the same level. Um, 
Certainly, in 2018, we did lose a lot of that species, and I'm sure it was directly due to the drought. Uh, I don't have the figures for the other species of which I showed pictures. Um, Lizzie Madison records uh, the Tuesday violet. Uh, I'm afraid the records for Helianthem, uh, sorry, for Hoary Rock Rose or Widmount Fell, the plot where we were recording, and these are just sample plots of the whole. They may not be totally typical, but for Hoary um, Wicklow Grass. In the plot we're recording, we don't have any plants at all now, and I know just a few plants have been, have been found on Widgebank Fell. There are rather more plants on Conklin Fell of that species, but it isn't recorded in detail over there. John has got some records this year, pleased to see. Um, is this due to climate change? Well, I just said I think the polygon has certainly been greatly reduced because of the dry conditions in the soil, probably the dry conditions more than the heat, but we don't actually know that. Uh, As far as the frequency of the species is concerned, and the records John has shown you was the distribution of plants. It was the number of plants. So if you've got a 10 metre square, so long as you've got one plant in it, John gave it a record, which you may have had 100 plants in it. Or you may not. Um, there are different methods of recording. What John is doing is giving us an overall picture of much bigger areas than I or Lizzie Madison are covering. But we've got more detail of smaller number of populations. Um, Certainly Lizzie and I know that the biggest threat to the rare species in the grassland is the closing of the habitat. There's a, no doubt that the lack of open space between plants for seedlings to germinate and get established is very important. Uh, dwarf milkwort is a short-lived perennial, on average, maybe seven years. Uh, Tuesday violets are long-lived perennials, and one would have hoped that those, they're almost like mini-trees, actually. They've got woody stems, and a lot of the relatives in the violet family are, in fact, shrubs or even trees. Those are mainly in the southern hemisphere. Well, I've seen a shrub this height in New Zealand with flowers that were recognizably as violet flowers. Uh, yes, but Closing of the habitat is a biggest threat to the plants. Uh, work is being done to try and open up the habitats. The numbers of grazing sheep on Widgebank has been increased over the last, well, five years or so. Uh, in which about pasture where you've got meadow and rough pasture type, 
all with rare species in them, uh, there is increasing grazing there. Uh, that's with the belted galloways and with sheep. Um, so, will the plant survive climate change? Well, first of all, we don't know how much the climate is going to change and how long there will be climate change and whether it will go on getting hotter. If we get more and more cold glacier ice, cold water going into the North Sea, what will happen if the Gulf Stream flips, the temperatures flip, all that cold water going in is heavier than warm sea water, and if the currents flip round and the Gulf Stream doesn't continue to lap round the British Isles, uh, are we in for another ice age? I don't think I'll be there then. <laughs> Some of you might. Uh, I don't know. There are a lot of unknowns, of course, there always are. And will the rare plant survive? A lot depends on whether we look after them. If we can arrange things to create open habitats for them, I think that would help whatever the climate does. Uh, we can't go around with watering cans if we get a very dry season. We <laughs> need an awful lot of them. So I think with the help of a lot of you people, the members of the Trust and the trustees will, they will try. We do need some we do need good people to come and join us and we do need to be able to continue with John's research so we know where things grow. We're fortunate in that there was a survey done on Clontifel in the 1970s which I hope John will be able to use as a baseline and compare what he's been doing in the last two years with that, like he was able to compare what he did on Wittibank with what I organised in the 1970s. Who would have thought that those people who crawled over Wittibank in the 1970s with me, and it wasn't always sunny and hot, <laughs> Uh, that the work that they were doing would form the baseline for work that John has been doing in the last few years. And likewise, the work that was done by Tim Bynes in the 1970s on Cronkley, I hope is going to be of a form that John can use. Uh, but we need to be able to carry on with John employing him to do it. So they all need to organise to get not only the children but adult people in Cheesedale to, to value the flora of Cheesedale, to embrace it, to think of it as something that's worth preserving, worth looking after. What would a tourist train do without the station? Mm -hmm. Or all the bed and breakfast and hotels and restaurants that advertise Tuesday Junction as being an attraction. County Durham, County Hall included, but they don't do much about helping to preserve it. But I'm sure with the help of people like you and 
many others, we can raise money. Everything costs money these days, as you know. Uh, we still need a bit of it to carry on with the work of the Teesdale, um, Teesdale Trust. Thank you all. Uh, No, tell you what. Yeah, okay. uh, well, I'll, I'll say what the question was, and then you right. might want to answer it, or else you know. So the question was, I think, um, the plants that we mentioned, are they seed-bearing? Do the seeds blow on oh. the wind, or do they just drop on the ground? Uh, they vary. Um, TZ Jackson uh, produces very small seeds in a capsule that's designed on a long stalk to wave around shedding the seeds, and the seeds are very small, but most of the spread of the uh, gentian is vegetatively. It's got a very effective way of growing, and research work that was done some years ago uh, showed there was actually a turnover in the population of 30% those that flowered died off, the rosettes, but you got a replacement uh, with... Oh, I seem to have lost something. <laughs> oh, it's okay. A replacement with new vegetative growth. Tisa Violet produces capsule with seed that's got an explosive way of spreading. Yes? Um, what are the variety? Uh, hoary whitlow grass uh, is a biennial plant and it produces lots of tiny seeds. They don't spread very far and only a proportion of them will grow out to make uh, fruiting flowers. Yeah. I'm wondering about the difference between uh, Gibeon and Cross and Sarah. Do you think that they are mutually logical or what do you mean by that? So the question was about why is there such a difference between the floor and wood bank and Cross and Sarah? Is it, is it geological or some other reason? I'd love to know what the difference <laughs> is. I'd love to know when. The gorge developed between Cronkley and Widgeman Felk. Uh, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If anyone could tell me when it developed, that might help. I, I think it must have been. Yeah. I sometimes wonder if it might be partly due to just chance, you know, whichever plants managed to establish originally. Uh, uh, kind of just lasted them? That, that part of it, yes. Uh, anyone? Yeah? Uh, you said that, that you didn't know whether the warming effect was operating by means of uh, dry natural algae or just by the air temperature. And it does strike me that I'm really bad at that because a lot of water is quite Uh, yeah, so, <laughs> I hope I can remember all of that. Uh, so the question was about uh, when you said before you weren't sure if the warming effect, the, the, the key thing was 
uh, that if it's drying habitat or what was the other thing? Or warming the air. And then um, the gentleman said that he was struck by there was a lot of water next to the habitat, so Woody Bank fell, which might be having an effect. And you could set up an experiment to uh, see what the effect of the, yeah. the water was. Have you thought about that? Um, if I put this down to the effect of having created the reservoir, which would be a body of water which would warm up in the summer and cool slowly in the autumn, but warm slowly in the spring. Uh, mm. I did attempt to set up an experiment to see the effect of that on the on certain plants. And the plants that we've been recording since then, I set up a permanent plot within a hundred meters of the top water line of the reservoir. I had another lot which were about 300 meters away and a further lot at 600 meters away. That included some of Cronkinfell. Um, I hope that that might help to show any effect because there was other work which definitely showed that change of slow warming, warming up of the ground near the reservoir in the spring and the slower cooling down in the autumn. Unfortunately, because it was ideal to have more than one plot at each of those levels, we found that the difference between the plots at any one level was greater than the difference between the different levels from the reservoir. So I really had to abandon that part of the experiment and continue the Migordi as a population dynamic study. Um, so, the, unfortunately, the short answer is that the experiments haven't been set up to find out the difference. Um, if it was possible to draw anything out of work that Alice and Jones did of a vegetation survey of Widgebank Fell, which he started at the same time as the rest when the reservoir was being built, with a repeat of that. Um, that's the only other sort of before and after I can think of, but the after hasn't been done, and in the present, uh, climate and botanical research, I don't think would get done. <laughs> sorry. No, I'm sorry. I think a missed opportunity with the money that was provided by ICI, but the research was directed by a Tuesday research committee, which didn't include me, and I may not have thought of that at the time. Um, it wasn't done. So we've time for one more question. Uh, yeah, man the back. Have we tried translocating any of the rare species between different fells or between different parts of the country? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, on the last bit, uh, when the reservoir was being built, there was obviously uh, ground with rare plants in um, that were going to be flooded. And uh, the site uh, liaison officer, Tom Buffy, at the time, he and I and 
also some other people we uh, we did in fact extract a very large number of the rare plants from the Britomar Basin. They went to uh, about 10 major uh, botanic gardens or universities with botanic gardens and uh, two major lots, one to Manchester and one to Durham. And Professor Valentine was still at Durham, but unfortunately he left almost immediately. Uh, at both places, uh, plants were established, those rare plants were established, there were about 20 species at each place, the same species, and uh, populations were established and recorded for a while. The Manchester ones were recorded for quite a long time, but then the superintendent in charge of those at Manchester retired. Manchester University wanted the ground for some extension. Durham University, um, the ambitious director of the Botanic Garden left. Uh, the university decided to make alterations and the whole lot of both sides got wiped away. A few plants went to Cambridge University, as far as I know, they are still being grown there. Uh, I don't know what happened to the other ones, as I've been too, present, too busy with present recording, getting money for the trust, John's recording, to follow the other ones up. The question about transplants is, do we know exactly what conditions any piece, any plant will uh, require? Do we know how well it will survive? And where can we transplant them? Uh, I think some work will be looked into now, so long as we can get the money to keep supporting it. Uh, some work has been done on the dwarf milkwell from Kent uh, by Kew University, the Wakeham uh, Gardens from the Millennium Seed Bank, uh, Millennium Seed Bank Trust. Uh, I hope we can get uh, them involved with some of the Tuesday plants this coming year. Um, but that's about as far as we've got, I think, on those. If you want to come and talk to me afterwards, do. Thanks. Okay, so I'll, I'll speak about that. Um, yes, so. Uh, just want to thank John and thank Margaret for uh, giving the talk. Um, thank you for all coming along. Um, just want to thank Helen Pett down the front here, who is filming the whole of this talk for us. She is um, actually working with Margaret to make a, a film as well. Um, the talk's been made possible by the Green Recovery Challenge Fund. And um, also, just I want to also thank our partners in terms of that. So. Northern Heartland, who are our key delivery talk. partner, and it's Naomi, who has been the, the main person who's organised this talk, which is the first in the series of our larger public lectures. Um, we have one on the 29th of September. Um, that is by a gentleman called Lee Schofield. He is uh, the reserve manager for the RSPB Horswater Estate. Um, he's just written a book called Wild, Wild Fell, and it's actually looking at sort of regenerating the landscape. So that'll be an interesting talk on the practical conservation side. In um, October, we've got Leif uh, Sweden coming to talk to us. And uh, he's going to talk about his adventures looking, visiting the different botanical hotspots throughout the UK. And we have a talk in November about the Millennium Seed Bank. Um, yes, uh, also just sort of thanking our, our 
supporters as well. So um, the project is supported by people in different organisations who sit in our steering group. So the Rabian, the Rabia Estate and the Strathmore Estates and um, Natural England, so Mark Furness of um, the Upper Teesdale National Nature Reserve and um, also the North Pennines AONB. So they provide us with uh, technical advice and guidance. Um, when we talked, the last question about species recovery, we, this is one of the areas that we're actually looking at under this project. So we have a gentleman called uh, Dr. David, David Otway, who is um, writing a species recovery plan for us. And that's actually just a broad overview of what might actually work or might not work. And then we'll take those forward. But what we have to do is identify what, what needs to be done, what we think will work and where we go next. And then we will be um, out looking for whatever the uh, the next project is that follows on from Plants on the Edge. Uh, this one finishes, uh, in terms of Plants on the Edge, uh, we finish work on this in March next year. Um, if you haven't seen the exhibition, that's here until the 29th and that's in the gallery at the Witham Hall. Um, and we'll probably need to leave the building fairly quickly this evening, but if you want to come back, then the exhibition's open. That's got more information about the special flora and it's also got the artwork that was produced by the school children as well. So once again, thank you very much for your time this evening. That's a good paper.